the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. And today I am once again joined by Sharon Bennett Connolly. Sharon, welcome back. Thank you, Rebecca. Nice to be here again. Uh, you know, the last time you were here, we talked about a bunch of Margaret's and Matilda's, if I remember correctly. Today might be equally as confusing. <laughs> 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 We're here today to talk about Sharon's new book, Heroines of the Tudor World. So to start off our conversation, I think the first question that I had when I was reading this book is, what, how did, I don't even know how to ask this, how did you determine what a heroine was? Well, it's actually... I use a broad spectrum as far as I'm concerned with heroines. Most women are heroines in my book, um, especially in medieval and Tudor times, because um, they had they were up against it. Women were so. Um, it's I will include people, women who stand out who might not necessarily be considered heroines for some people. You know, like there's mistresses in there, and, um, poems and things like that. But they're women who stand out and have a story to tell. And Heroines of the Tudor World is actually a sort of sequel to my first ever book, Heroines of the Medieval World, which yeah. meant there were a couple of things I didn't have to decide because my idea was to replicate Heroines of the Medieval World in Tudor times. So I kept exactly the same chapter titles, except for... The medieval ideal became the Tudor ideal. So it was one less thing I had to think about. Nice. <laughs> what type of women to include. <laughs> um, and it turned into, it was an interesting study of um, how women had moved on from medieval to Tudor times. In some ways, not very much. And in other ways, quite a lot. And um, one thing, uh, the first review came out yesterday. And one thing Tony Richards said about it was that he was amazed how resilient Tudor women were. And it's like, yeah, actually, women in medieval times and in Tudor times, they had to be resilient. And it was just interesting the way he said that, because I think that was one of the things that struck me when I was writing about it, how incredibly strong these women were and the challenges they faced. Um, it was remarkable. And even if they didn't appear as heroines at the time, you know, Anne Boleyn has her fans, but she also has her haters. But I think what can't be denied is the impact they had on their world and on our world. Yeah, most definitely. I think uh, when we talk about medieval women and Tudor women, we know we know how repressed they were, but that doesn't make them any less strong than the men. And I think it almost goes the same for women today is there is still some repression with women, but at mm -hmm. the heart of it, at the soul of it, we are still strong in character. And I think that's really the ideal of this book is how strong women can be. Yes, definitely. That's what I was trying to show, that there, it doesn't matter what these women did so much as that they did it, and that they were there, they were present, the women wrote their own life stories or survived, you know, <laughs> actually managed to face challenges and survive. Right. Do you, do you think, here, here's probably an oddball question, because sometimes I think of these things, do you think had you lived in Tudor times, you would have survived? <laughs> <laughs> I think I um possibly not. <laughs> but it's hard to think that way, isn't it? Because I feel like as as women now, we can be way more vocal and we can yeah. have a, have opinions. And when yeah. you when you think of the Tudor era or even the medieval mm -hmm. era. Um, having an opinion or being loud about something was definitely frowned upon. Yeah, and I live in Yorkshire, so I would have been right in the middle of the Pilgrimage of Grace. Actually, I live on the border of Lincolnshire, 
and mm. Yorkshire. So it would have been in the middle of the Lincolnshire Rebellion, which was immediately <laughs> followed by the Pilgrimage of Grace. So I would have stood no chance. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, you know, you had mentioned how you had a chapter on mistresses, and I was surprised when I saw the heading Tudor mistresses because I thought, how on earth would these women be heroines? So, with that in mind, of the mistresses that you wrote about, which was your favorite? Um, I've always had a soft spot for Bessie Blount. Uh, I think the remarkable one for me was Mary Boleyn. Um, because we actually know so little about her relationship with Henry that it could even have been a one-night stand. Um, you know, there's so little information out there. Yes, she had a relationship with Henry. We know this because Henry said, was once accused of sleeping with Mary and Anne's mum. And he said, the sister, yes, but never the mother. Yeah. So we know he slept with Mary Boleyn. He admitted it. But that's all we know. There's such little information about it. We don't know how long it lasted. You know, some people conjecture that Catherine Carey, Mary's eldest child, was Henry's. But there's nothing to say so. Uh, so she was really interesting to look into and to actually present like that. But there's also Diane de Poitiers, mm. who was the mistress of Henry II of France. And <laughs> it was incredibly interesting writing her story because she was an older woman um she was about six or seven years older than henry and she was introduced to him when he was about 15 to teach him the ways of the world and then he married catherine de medici but kept diane de poitier as his mistress and the relationship the marriage between henry and catherine was very rocky and henry wasn't attracted to catherine uh, sexually, he preferred the de Poitiers. And there's these stories of her getting Henry worked up, warmed up, and sending him off to have sex with Catherine de Medici. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you feel incredibly sorry for Catherine de Medici because this strong, independent woman who's her husband's mistress seems to rule the roost, whereas she's the queen but has such little power. But then she gets her revenge when Henry is killed in a jousting accident, because from that moment on, Diane de Poitiers is sent away and doesn't even get to say goodbye to Henry. And okay. you can understand where Catherine de Medici is coming from, because this woman has been in her marriage from the very beginning. Yeah, but how incredibly it, difficult. She just, I just, um, she was, I was umming and ahhing about putting her in as a heroine because of the relationship with Catherine de Medici and I have every sympathy for Catherine de Medici but I wanted to tell the story of their relationship rivalry and that seemed to be the best way to do it because it's such an incredible you just wouldn't countenance it these days would you <laughs> no and I think the part of the story that you told that I never knew because it's a part of history I haven't really studied is uh, how Catherine had had this premonition, or um, I don't remember if that's exactly what it was, about Henry dying. And yeah. and on the day of the jousting incident, how Diane had pushed Henry to keep going and keep going, and Catherine didn't want him to, mm -hmm. which inevitably resulted in Henry getting the splinter of wood in his eye. Yeah, it, it must have been horrendous. And the thing is, Catherine didn't want him to, but Henry's death brought her into the limelight and gave her absolute power. You know, her sons were too young to inherit the throne, so she was regent. She'd managed to get rid of Diane de Poitiers. She was in charge from that moment on. And you've got this juxtaposition of her life with Henry um, where she is absolutely powerless even to get the mistress dismissed. And mm. then the life after Henry, where everybody does what she says. And it's like she didn't have the training that Diane de Poitiers would have been able to use because she was kept out of council meetings and things. But when it came to it, to ruling for her son, she certainly put her best foot forward. Yeah, she definitely did. You know, I 
Part of me feels a bit sympathetic for Diane, too, because what was she to do? Although she clearly had a hand in it. And, (laughs) um, you know, whether or not she loved Henry, I mean, do we know whether it was a a love match between the two of them? Or was it more of a situation where she didn't have a choice? Yeah, it certainly was a love match on Henry's behalf. I think for Diane, it probably was. Um, the choice she didn't, if she wanted to stay relevant, she had to stay with Henry. You know, she didn't, she could have retired somewhere peacefully, I suppose, and let Henry and Catherine get on with it. But I think she was um, a very intelligent woman, and retirement would have been seen as total boredom for her. So mm. she, she had the political astuteness to be at the centre of the court. So um, she used it. And the French had this attitude. They had a maître sans titre, a mistress in residence sort of thing for the king. There was always this one woman. And it had happened even before the end of Poitiers. You'd had Agnes Sorrel. Um, So they were used to the king having a wife and having a mistress, and the mistress being a political power. You know, Mm. people knew they if they went to Diane de Poitiers and asked her for help to get to Henry, she was she was the gateway. Yeah. And and if I recall too, that's what Henry the Eighth wanted to make Anne Boleyn. Yes, he offered her the title and she said no. I can't blame her. but... (laughs) But if you really if you think about it, she kind of was, even though maybe they didn't go that far in their relationship, Mm. people still knew that Anne had this power. Because yeah. of her closeness to the king. So in a sense, mm-hmm. he got his way, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, he, just, he didn't get the benefits. He <laughs> right, right. benefits. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> well, you mentioned <laughs> you mentioned Bessie Blount, who is also one of my favorite women from the Tudor period. And she was the mother of Henry Fitzroy, Henry's Mm. illegitimate yet acknowledged son. What is it about her story that you love so much? Well, I live just on the borders with Lincolnshire. And Bessie Blount, once she had given birth to Henry, she was married to Gilbert Tailboys, who is a Lincolnshire lord. And then she married Edward Fines de Clinton, who is also an Lincolnshire lord. So she she um she had a lot of influence just down the road from me. Um so I do like local links, you know, when you you're reading something and you go somewhere and you're like, oh, she's actually local to me. So I look it's a bit more it's another area of interest. Um but I love the fact that although she was the king's mistress, she had an illegitimate son by the king. Henry looked after her. You know, he'd send her Christmas gifts, not her husband, her, and um, reward her with things. Um, I don't think he liked Gilbert Tailboys very much because it specifically says that he didn't reward Gilbert. It was just Bessie. Mm. (laughs) And she had a life after Henry, you know, because she'd had the son and she'd left court and married. She had a life after Henry, away from the politics and away from the machinations of the court, so to speak. And she had, um, she married Gilbert Tailboys and had children, and then she married Edward Vines de Clinton and had children. And she had, she she actually probably was the best kind of mistress because she was there when Henry needed her, had the child, and was happy to be discarded or at least got a better life as a result of being discarded. Yeah. And she didn't ask for anything. So I think that helps Henry, you know, that made Henry like her. She didn't ask for much. She just wanted, you know, she was happy to just get away from him. (laughs) He was like, why can't them, why can't all my exes be like this? (laughs) (laughs) I, you know, you talked about how um, Bessie was at court as um, I think at the time was she a maid of honor of Catherine of Aragon? Yes. Yeah, and how Henry was attracted to, you know, that she, of course, was attractive and that she had a good singing voice and all of these things. Are there any portraits of Bessie anywhere so that we have an idea of what she actually looked like? Not, but no, I don't think there are. I couldn't find any. There's one on her, I think it's her brother's tomb, that is purported to be Bessie, but it's a carving and... 
I don't think it's very flattering. So, you know, it just, <laughs> just looks like it's a very um, standard image of somebody. You wouldn't actually know. Definitely look at it and go, oh, that's Bessie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she was beautiful. It's a one-dimensional yeah. image of her. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a Tudor woman. It could be any Tudor woman, but somebody said it's, bless- it's Bessie. So. You know, I, I, it's so hard to imagine what it was like to be a mother back then. And especially the mother of someone who was seen as one of the heirs of Henry VIII mm. and to be separated from your child. Yeah, that... and they were very early. He was still a baby when she was when she was probably forced to leave him. You know, she was married off and he was left in the care of tutors and guardians to be raised as a prince. Right. And even though she was a mistress of Henry VIII or an ex-mistress of Henry VIII, she had to hold some type of power because her son was the illegitimate yet acknowledged son and possible Mm. heir of Henry VIII too, right? I think she could have done if she wanted to, but she doesn't appear to have wanted to. You know, I mean, it was interesting. They say, you know, she, she was married off and her son was left in, had his own household. But there's this little story where her her younger sons were given the cast off the cast off clothes from Henry Fitzroy. So it's like, well, she must have still had a relationship with Henry Fitzroy because you know she she was getting his clothes once he'd grown out of them. So she she must have still seen him and still had time spent time with him and bought him things and that, which I think is really sweet. Yeah, I like that connection. Yeah, a connection between a mother and a child is so strong. And I think Mm. even if you're separated from them, there still has to be some sort of connection there. Oh, yes. (laughs) Let's move away from mistresses to religion. (laughs) How's that for a segue? (laughs) Uh, This one's not so sweet. (laughs) When I think of heroines in religion, the first person that comes to mind for me is Anne Askew, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with Anne's story, do you want to maybe give a brief overcap of or overview of what her story was? I'll try. Um, it started with she and her. She had an older sister who was about a year older than her, who was betrothed to be married to Thomas Kime, and just before the marriage, she died. The sister. So rather than the marriage be called off. Her father and Kime arranged that Anne Askew would marry Thomas Kime instead, which was done. So it wasn't her choice of husband. She was being a dutiful daughter by marrying this man. They had two sons, and he, by all accounts, was a staunch Catholic and a horrible man, from what I can tell. Um, She was very intelligent and very educated young woman. She had been taught to read and to write, and she knew her Bible, and she started. This was at a time when England was in, amidst the Reformation, in the upheaval. Henry had introduced, had departed from the Catholic Church, from the, from the Pope, but he was still Catholic. So rules were changing all the time. But at one point, Noble and gentle women were allowed to read the Bible in English in public. Mm. And Anne did this. And she did it in, at one stage, she actually went to Lincoln Cathedral and read the Bible in Lincoln Cathedral. She wasn't supposed to read it out loud because that would be a woman teaching and that wasn't allowed to happen. So... The priest in the cathedral got really angry at her because I think she must have been reading aloud rather than out loud, which is a distinction in my book. Um, so the Lincolnship, Lincoln Cathedral's priest got angry with her. Her husband heard about it and he eventually kicked her out of the house. And he probably beat her first. It sounds like their relationship was not a very friendly one. So she went down to London in search of a divorce, thinking that if the kings managed to get a divorce, then maybe I can get one. 
and she joined the crowd of reformers in London who were questioning, you know, the Catholic Church and looking at Protestantism, Protestantism as a way forward. She never managed to get her divorce. Um, it was rumoured that she had spoken with Queen Catherine Parr and Catherine Willoughby, the Duchess of Suffolk. Her brother worked for Catherine Willoughby. So there was a relationship there, um, which meant that, you know, if anyone looked hard enough, they could possibly claim that Catherine Willoughby was involved in Anne's um, naughty things. And Anne got accused of heresy. She was charged with it. She, she did um, come to a couple of trials. Her family and friends got her off a couple of times, but then she did get charged with heresy and found guilty. And she was going to be executed. And the distinction with Anne is that between the time she was found guilty and sentenced to death and the time she was tied at the stake, she was tortured in the Tower of London. Now, it is illegal in England to torture somebody who's already been condemned to death. So uh, um, the main torturer, Thomas Ridsley, the Earl of Southampton, was trying to get Anne Askew to implicate the women of the court. He was trying to prove that Catherine Parr was reading heretical tracts with Anne Askew, and he was trying to get Anne Askew to name all these women of the court as being guilty of heresy, and she didn't. She withstood, either she didn't know, or she totally withstood the torture, and the torture was so bad, she was racked. Um and all her limbs were dislocated so that she had to be carried on a chair on the back of a cart to her um, execution because she couldn't stand up. You know, her legs and arms were dislocated at the hip and shoulders and she had to be tied on a chair to the stake to be burned to death. It's just horrendous what men can do to women when they're in such power over them, it's it's just horrendous. You know, you mentioned in the book, too, with her dislocated limbs, when she was being brought to the stake, how bumpy of a ride that would have been and yes. how painful it would have been. Yeah. I think we forget the pain that comes with dislocation, not just your arms, mm -hmm. but your legs, too. I can't even imagine the incredible pain she must have been in. Yeah, I can't imagine she stayed awake. You know, it's like, it's just incredible what she could go through. And I don't think I realized that she had already been charged before mm. they tortured her. That's yeah. crazy. Mm. She, to me, is a true heroine. Yeah. You know, and we don't know for sure if she knew Catherine Parr's part in everything, but I think, I think it might be safe to assume she knew something and mm, it may be i mean she wrote and or dictated um some of her life story so that what we know of what happened to her is in her is from her own words so and she never says that she did that she ever saw the queen but then again she wouldn't because you know this she was writing this to be read but at a time when Henry VIII was still very much alive and he would put Catherine Parr in danger. Right. And she does admit that some of the women of the court sent her money because her husband had kicked her out without any money, so she needs money to live on. And some sympathetic women of the court sent her money, but she doesn't say that it was in return for anything. Mm. Was it true that Anne Seymour supplied gunpowder to help speed up the, her death at the end? Um, I think so. That's what... I read, and um, it makes sense. It happened an awful lot. You do read an awful lot that um, people were killed by gunpowder either around their neck or around their waist, preferably around the waist because the flames don't have to reach so high um, uh, so that the suffering's not as long as it should be. And I think, to be honest, I think most executioners would do it as well because... In those days, executions were entertainment. 
but there's a fine line between watching somebody burn as a heretic and it being quick than watching it like take 40, 50 minutes or an hour and them screaming all yeah. the time. People are not going to like the authorities as much. It's not entertainment if you're listening to somebody screaming in agony all the time. You start feeling sympathy for them. And the authorities don't want you to feel sympathy for the bad guy for in their eyes, the bad guys. Yeah, exactly. That is a great point. They're like, okay, well, you know, we'll torture you and we'll make you die this horrible death, but we'll try to do it quickly so that you still think we're doing it for the right reasons. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm glad that you brought up Catherine Parr. And and I say that because we obviously we have that movie coming out this summer, Firebrand, based on yes. The Queen's Gambit, which was a book I really enjoyed. And in that story, Catherine Parr, I think in the trailer that I saw too, and I didn't remember this from the book, Catherine Parr witnesses and preaching. And mm. so I think it's good that we're talking about this now to let people know just because you see it on the screen doesn't mean it's necessarily true. No, it's possible she did. Um, but like you say, it's just one of those things. Nobody's going to admit it if she did. <laughs> so. Right. Catherine's not going to admit it. No. <laughs> <laughs> she was in an impossible situation and yes. you know i want to talk about Catherine parr next because she is one of the women that you discuss in this book of course and one mm -hmm. of the things that you said is you did not want the book to focus on the six wives of henry the eighth but you still need to talk about them in their in yeah. their own respect and you know, Catherine came to the throne as queen consort of henry the eighth because she felt called by god to do so and her own religious leanings kind of led her in one direction, which was the direction Henry claimed he wanted to go. But I think in his heart, he was always a Catholic. Mm, and what an impossible situation she must have felt she was in because she had this whole sector of Protestants or reformists, we should call them back mm. then, who were going in that direction while Henry was still kind of stuck in his own ways. How do you see Catherine in the religious sector? I think she was a very clever lady and very intelligent. And she actually managed to walk a very fine line because she could steer Henry gently, but she had to know when to stop because Henry was one of those people who believed he was in the right and didn't think that anyone had the right to tell him how to do things. So, and she also had, you see, with the, uh, when um, there was this arrest warrant issued for Catherine and she managed to get to Henry and he turned around and, and said that she was being led astray and that she needed him to tell her what the best, what she should be thinking. And Henry forgave her and, denied the arrest warrant altogether and said, no, somebody else had done that. I never agreed to it. Um, but the arrest warrant shows that Catherine had enemies at court. And that people, again, with the um, interrogation of Anne Askew, people were always trying to find an advantage and access to the king and entry to the king. And they would do that at the expense of anybody, including the queen. If bringing down the queen brought them favour, and they'd seen it happen before and it worked, then they would do it. So Catherine was, it was a walking a very fine line. She knew, possibly, she was aware that Henry was get, getting more ill and that might not be around for long, but she was also aware that, you know, he was hurting an awful lot, had a dreadful temper, and had already killed two wives. You know, right. she knew what a fine line she was walking, and yet she still did it, and she still managed to help the reform religious reformers. But she did it in a way that didn't put her in danger most of the time. Um, so it's she, her intelligence must have been off the charts, mm. and you know, it's just like and the bravery, the courage of taking on Henry as his queen and knowing that you're actually walking into a viper's nest as a result. You know, the Tudor court at those times were 
um, fraught with divisions because you also had the Seymours there who were protecting the interests of Edward, the Prince of Wales, because whilst Edward was Prince of Wales and the heir to the throne, their mm. ultimate power was guaranteed so long as they protected him and anyone who threatened Edward's position would be an enemy. Yeah. And it's actually, after Henry VIII's death, you see Anne Seymour um, going head to head with Catherine Parr about the crown jewels and, you know, saying that she, Catherine Parr, who was still Queen of England, shouldn't have the crown jewels anymore because she'd married Thomas Seymour and was therefore for, uh, therefore forfeit her rights to them. So then Anne Seymour's walking around in the crown jewels in the Queen's jewels. And she had no more right to them. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I struggle with that part of the story so much because it just seems so vindictive. Yeah, and of, unjust. <laughs> yes, definitely. Definitely. And one of the questions, obviously, I think anybody who's listening to the show knows I've been studying Thomas Seymour <laughs> and the Seymours. But one of the questions that I get often is, do you think Thomas and Catherine had an affair while she was married to Henry VIII? And to me, I think the question or the answer is obvious. There is no way either of them would have risked it because there was no. so much at risk for them. I don't think so either. I think it was a case of wait. He's not going to last much longer, although you can't actually say that about the king. You end up... Um, on a funeral pyre, if you do. Um, but yeah, I think it, they probably had an agreement where, you know, yes, I'll marry the king and then I'll come to you when it's over. Yeah, and which they did, didn't they? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does make you wonder what history would have been like had Catherine Parr survived after the birth of her child, Mary. It well does. And you wonder also whether Catherine... You know, I think she was so eager to make her own choice in Thomas Seymour that she probably didn't think as sensibly as she had done on other things. Yeah, I think she was um, choosing with her heart most of the time at that point, I think. Mm. I always say there is no doubt if you look at the letters between them, how much she adored him. She loved yeah. him so much. And I think he loved her, too. But I'm not going to get into all that because I could talk about those two forever. <laughs> forever yeah. <laughs> when we talk about royal marriages you know henry VIII's first wife catherine of aragon the longest wife i think they were married was it 24 years yeah something like that wasn't it she yeah, definitely like you know had an impact on english history and she mm. is one of those people who should be a martyr it seems for everything that she did what is your impression yeah. of catherine of aragon I think she was a very strong woman. She was, I mean, she went through a heck of a lot even before she married Henry. You know, losing her first husband at such a young age. Then being a pawn in the disputes between her father and her father-in-law. You know, Henry VII wasn't sending her back to Spain. Ferdinand of Aragon wasn't paying her dowry. Nobody was giving her any money. You know, she was just supposed to stay living in London, but nobody was actually helping her until Henry comes along when he becomes king and more or less rescues her and makes her queen. Um, but then she seems to have... You do wonder why she didn't, after passing her childbearing years, why she didn't just retire, retire to a monastery. But then you look at it and think she actually was trying her best to save Henry's soul. Because mm. as far as she was concerned, Henry breaking with the Pope was putting his eternal his soul into damnation. So she was trying her best to make sure Henry's soul was saved. But I don't know, someone, part of me thinks you should have just given up <laughs> and let his soul be done because it was going to be anyway. <laughs> right. Well, and she was Spanish, right? So she had some of that Spanish pride. She was raised yes. to be queen of England and to yeah, have and that. Been, oh, go ahead. And she'd been trained, you know, she'd been going to be queen of England since she was, what, two years old or something? Yeah. 
Although that's another question I have. Okay, if they had decided when they were two and three years old that Arthur and Catherine were going to get married, why did nobody think in England think I'll teach Arthur to speak Spanish and nobody in Spain think I'll teach Catherine to speak English? So that when they're 15 years old and they meet, it's like neither of them can speak to the other one in a language they know except Latin. <laughs> it's like it's an oversight on the part of their tutors that they didn't say, you know what, just learn a bit of Spanish before you meet your wife. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. I guess I never thought, now I'm going to have to ask Dr. Emma about that and see if she knows the answer to that. Why didn't they? Why? <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> Big oversight. <laughs> you had all these years. Why weren't you? <laughs> you know, Elizabeth of York was going to marry the Dauphin of France at one stage. She was taught French. She could speak French. <laughs> nobody, you know, these kids had been destined for each other since they were babies, and nobody thought to teach them the language. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Well, Catherine of Aragon could have been seen as a captive queen, and one of your chapters is captive heroines. And, of course, the one that stood out the most to me um, was Margaret Plantagenet, the Countess of Salisbury. Yes. Um, that's Her story, to me, is one of the saddest ones yes. in history. I mean, her upbringing and all the way to her death is... Just tragic. Why don't you talk about her a little bit? It is. It's so very tragic. I mean, she was the daughter of George Duke of Clarence, who, again, not the wisest person in Christendom. So <laughs> you, she's off to a bad start in the first place. You know, her dad gets executed for rebelling against his brother again. Mm -hmm. uh, Mom dies in childbirth. And she's like one of these inconvenient cousins nobody knows exactly what to do with her she is raised as a princess you know because she she is part of the royal family and then she's married off she her the count as countess of salisbury it's in her own right that's her title not her husband's which um is unusual in those days anyway but she's married off and she has a whole load of children and one of her sons reginald pole becomes a cardinal and he is vehemently opposed to Henry VIII's divorce from Catherine of Aragon and marriage to Anne Boleyn and he makes sure everybody knows about it which is fine he's safe he's in Rome he's abroad he can say whatever he wants about Henry and Henry can't get to him but he can get to Reginald's mum mm. poor Count Margaret Countess of Salisbury she's she becomes Henry's target because he can't get to Reginald. And she's arrested and basically executed because he can't get to Reginald. And it's just the poor woman's never done anything wrong. She's towed the line all the way through. She's 68. You know, she should be spent at home with her grandchildren. Instead, Henry has this been addictive streak in him that means I can't get to Reginald so I'll get to you and he arrests her puts her in the tower and executes her and her grandson's in the tower as well he, he was only a child and he was held in the tower you know he had this Henry was after the poles um but the only one he could actually get to was well there were a few others he executed as well but Margaret was the main one you know she was his mum's cousin she was family and that's how he treats family. <laughs> Mind you, he can execute two women he went to bed with. So <laughs> we shouldn't really be surprised, should we? <laughs> no, not at all. Her execution is still one of the worst yeah. executions that I have ever heard of. Just being hacked to death, basically. Mm. Um, I would... I think I would really not ask to be beheaded if I was executed in medieval or Tudor times because there are so many times where the executioner just misses. or Because Mary, Queen of Scots, gets it in the shoulder first. Yeah. Um, there was a chap, Edmund, Earl of Kent, who was the brother of Edward II and the uncle of Edward III, um, who tried to rescue Edward II. Um, 
they couldn't find an execution. The executioner ran off, refused to execute him because he was he was Edmund the Kent. He was the son of a king. Um, so they couldn't. They had to pay somebody, um, an amateur, to execute him. And he was so drunk, it took something like twelve or fourteen blows to execute the poor fella. It's like you know, executions. In the, Anne Boleyn was lucky that it was a sword and one strike, because uh, most of the time it wasn't. <laughs> Right. And I think the fact that executioners often got drunk beforehand says something yeah. that it wasn't for someone with a weak stomach. I don't know no. who, who on earth would want to volunteer for a job like that, no matter how much money you were offered to do it. Mm -hmm. Especially when I think it would also have been more difficult with women to execute women, you know, um, is seen more as executing men. Well, they probably they usually have um, conspired against the king. Whereas with these women, it was just because the king decided he wanted to go a different way, get a different wife, or yeah. couldn't couldn't get to Reginald Pole, so executed Margaret Pole. It's like you know, I think. Henry VIII doesn't come out very well in my book. <laughs> I don't think he does in many people's books, to be honest with you. <laughs> but he is... He... everybody. If you want to read a book that says Henry VIII was wonderful and a hero, and <laughs> he's not heroines of the Judah world. <laughs> no, he is definitely not in it. <laughs> I do like how you talked about Elizabeth of York, because really without her, where would the Tudor dynasty be? She really had a heavy weight on her shoulders at the beginning, didn't she? She did. And she is in, I think she's the first one I actually write about in the book. She's the Tudor ideal as far as, you know, and I think she was Henry VIII's ideal as well. I think if he'd managed to find a wife who could be exactly like Elizabeth of York, loving, caring, and producing child upon child upon child year after year, um, he would have been as happy as Larry. And it's because he didn't get that relationship. No no fault of Catherine of Aragon's part whatsoever. She produced the children. They just didn't survive. Um, whereas Elizabeth of York, she produced, I think she had about eight children, only four of whom survived past childhood. And then Arthur dies in mid teens So she's only, there's only three left, but at least there were three surviving and one son in Henry. Uh, but she died trying to give Henry the Seventh another son. You know, she went after Arthur died in 14, 1502. She, she got pregnant again, even though she was 36, in order to produce as a spare heir mm -hmm. and it turned out to be a girl and she died and giving birth but she basically sacrificed herself for the future of the Judah dynasty right and and if you think about it her daughter Margaret is really the one with the longest lasting legacy you know she went to Scotland and the yeah uh, I think uh King Charles is it right King Charles is related to her yeah, he's descended directly from her. Um, although she had as her marital history was almost as um, colourful as Henry's. Yeah, it really was, wasn't it? <laughs> I think they were um, competing on the number of divorces. <laughs> right. It's funny now that you say that too. If you look at the Scottish queens, if you compare Margaret Tudor and Mary Queen of Scots, they really had a way with husbands, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And fleeing to England when they needed help. Yeah, neither of them had great choices in husbands. <laughs> no, but to be fair, they're usually their first choice wasn't their own. No. But and um, turned out to be the better marriages as well. You know, Margaret and James the Fourth, until he was killed at Flod and she they were fine. Um but her next choice next she had two more husbands and she divorced both of them. Mm -hmm. um, and Mary, Queen of Scots, marrying Francis of France, that would have been, just think how life would have been different for her if Francis had lived. Right. And yeah. it would have been so different for Scotland because they would have had a queen in Mary, Queen of Scots, but they would have been ruled from France by a, a vice regent or something in 
place in Scotland acting for Mary. Um, well, she probably never would have, you know, she she wouldn't have been, if she and Francis had stayed married and had children, her second son would have probably been King of Scotland, her eldest son King of France. It would have been, you know, it would have changed everything. It really would have. And I think I often think about the troubles that happened between her and Elizabeth. But if we really, if we go back to even Mary the first and look at all the drama that came with Mary the first wanting to marry Philip and mm -hmm. how um, the English nobles were so worried about Spain yeah. ruling England. And then we had Mary queen of Scots who mm -hmm. had her own marital marital problems it's no wonder Elizabeth the first did not want to get married. I mean, she <laughs> looked at her sister and her cousin and went, Whoa, I don't know about this. <laughs> yeah. And her mum's experience and her stepmom, Catherine Howard's experience, who was also her cousin. You know, you just, people say, I'm so surprised Elizabeth didn't marry. I would have been surprised if she had. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so <laughs> easy to judge not. her. Yeah, she did not have an example of a good marriage, even after Henry VIII's death and she was in Catherine Parr's household. You know, then Thomas Seymour starts looking at her and yeah. the one time that she had a stable family life, it was taken from her because of suspicions of other people and Thomas Seymour acting a little bit too irresponsibly towards her when she was a teenager. Yeah. I totally understand why she never married and didn't trust men in that way. Well, it was always about power. Men were looking for power and they would go right. after it however they could. And, you know, Thomas Seymour saw Elizabeth as power and closeness to the throne. I don't believe he ever wanted the throne for himself. I think that was that would have been suicide if that were the case. He had his nephew. No, I think he he I think he thought if he could get Elizabeth on the throne, he could be the power behind it, marry yeah. or marry her and be the power behind it. Um I'm not sure he thought too far ahead. I'm not sure he <laughs> thought enough about what he was going to do. <laughs> I will agree with you on that statement. <laughs> I think he was definitely a loose cannon who kind of reacted yeah. from the hip and then paid for the consequences later. Yes, definitely. <laughs> well, think, luckily, Elizabeth was a little bit smarter. I mean, you look yeah. at, she's the last person in the book, and I did that deliberately. Everybody reading the book will be going, where's Elizabeth? Where's Elizabeth? She's right at the end. Because the last chapter is on the survivors. And Elizabeth is the ultimate survivor, as far as I'm concerned. She, that she actually managed to become queen at all. When you look at what she went through in the first 25 years of her life, it's remarkable that she managed to survive so much. And come out of it with such intelligence and such ability to rule England for 45 years. You right. know, she, she's a little bit of a hero of mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love, well, you know, uh, to, to end this conversation today, I am curious to know, of all of the women you discussed in this book, and there is a lot of women, we joked at the beginning how many there are and how hard it would be for you to, keep count of how many you wrote about was there one for you that stood out above all the others not one there were a good few i love the idea of grace o'malley who's the irish pirate queen sort of thing <laughs> but um she, but she was also um a chieftain in ireland in her own right and she um she went through so many hardships, lost husbands and sons, and actually managed to get an audience with Elizabeth I. And I just got this image of Elizabeth and Grace O'Malley, you know, the queen and the pirate queen, having a conversation with each other about men and go, oh, tell me about it. No. <laughs> Oh, I love that. If you want to learn more about Grace, you should definitely check out Sharon's book, Heroines of the Tudor World. I highly recommend it. It's very well written. There are so many people for you to learn about in it. And the way it's broken down by chapters, really, if you wanted to, you could skip from chapter to chapter from any day. And it's easy if you want to go back and 
and maybe use it as a research piece as well to go, oh, I want to look at who the warrior heroines were. You know, I'm going to look at those today. So Sharon, thank you so much for coming on the show today and telling us about these amazing women. Thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. And we have literally just skimmed the surface of the book. There's so much more in there. (laughs) Yeah, we definitely have. So I recommend you go out and get the book. Um, I will include links in the show notes for everybody. Is it available in the U.S. yet, Sharon? No, I haven't got a date for the U.S. yet. I'm waiting to hear back from my publisher. It's out in the U.K. on the 15th of June. Um, U.S. is usually six months later, so I'm hoping it will be out just before Christmas. Okay, but if you are in the U.S., you can still buy the book and order it from Mm -hmm. the U.K. and have it shipped here. So don't wait. Order this book because you will not regret it. Sharon, thank Thank you you again. Thank you, Rebecca. It's been lovely talking with you. (laughs) The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast.